Good evening. This right here is the World Economic Forum. It's the annual meeting that's held over in Davos, Switzerland, wherein the world's elites come together, usually in their private jets, in order to mingle, plan out the future, and also, ironically, to lay the groundwork for reducing the world's carbon footprint. Is that it allows us, the normal people, to catch a glimpse of the thinking of these particular individuals. Because very often, the World Economic Forum is a place where they say the quiet part out loud. In fact, throughout the years, the Davos elite have made some, you can say, highly disturbing statements which really don't get the media attention that they deserve. And in fact, when you piece all these individual statements together, you wind up with an overarching theme. The total control of humanity using the media, science, and technology to reshape democracies and form something like a global government. Now granted, that might sound very conspiratorial. However, let's go through the nine most dystopian things that are currently being pushed by the World Economic Forum right now, and then you can decide for yourself whether it's conspiratorial or not. And if you like this type of content, please do me a favor and smash that like button so you can be shared out to ever more people, and also subscribe. That way you can get these types of videos delivered to your YouTube feed every single weekday. And also, I'd like to give a big shout out to the Vigilant Citizen for putting a lot of this research together. And now let's start with number nine penetrating governments. According to statements that have been made by Mr. Klaus Schwab, who is both the founder as well as the current head of the World Economic Forum, he appears to perceive democracy as an obstacle to a totally globalized world. In fact, in a report titled Global Redesign that was released in 2010 by the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab wrote that a quote, globalized world is best managed by a self-selected coalition of multinational corporations, governments, including through the UN system, and select civil society organizations, CSOs. Which, quite frankly, already sounds like the total opposite of democracy, but he actually continues, quote, Governments are no longer the overwhelmingly dominant actors on the world stage, and that the time has come for a new stakeholder paradigm of international governance. Now, you might look at that statement and you might say, you know, it does sound like he wants to achieve a one-world international government. But so what? It's not like he can actually achieve it. Except for the fact that in a speech that he delivered to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government back in 2017, Klaus Schwab openly admitted what has been described as a conspiracy theory for many years now, the fact that his organization is penetrating governments around the entire world. Take a listen. And I have to say, um, when I mention our names like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet, are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world economy right. form. And that's true in Argentina, too. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina, and uh, it's true in France now. Mm -hmm. I'm here with the president, with the young global leader. Meaning that up on stage, in a recorded speech, Klaus Schwab openly bragged about how Angela Merkel of Germany, Vladimir Putin of Russia, Emmanuel Macron of France, Justin Trudeau of Canada, as well as about half of his cabinet, were members of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders Program. And so given statements like that, it's not too much of a wonder why the Transnational Institute described the World Economic Forum as a, quote, silent global coup d'etat to capture governance. And now, number eight, controlling minds using sound waves and microchips which, like everything else, might sound conspiratorial. However, up on screen is an actual article that was published by the World Economic Forum in 2018 titled, Mind Control Using Sound Waves. We ask a scientist how it works. Now, oddly enough, that particular article is no longer available on the World Economic Forum's website. But have no fear, because the internet never forgets. And so there is an archive version of that article. And by the way, I'll throw that link alongside all the other links that we discuss into the description box below this video so you can check it all out for yourself. And in that 2018 article, it touts this new technology as a possible treatment for things like Parkinson's disease as well as Alzheimer's. But it also states that it can be used to completely control a person's mind, remotely. Here's a pullout from that particular article. Quote, 
I can see the day coming where a scientist will be able to control what a person sees in their mind's eye by sending the right waves to the right place in their brain. My guess is that most objections will be similar to those we hear today about subliminal messages and advertisements, only much more vehement. This technology is not without its risks of misuse. It could be a revolutionary healthcare technology for the sick or a perfect controlling tool with which the ruthless control the weak. This time, though, the control will be literal. That is quite dystopian, even more so given the fact that the gist of the article seems to be that this technology is inevitable and the only way that it can be curtailed is if it's regulated by some organization. Here's how the Vigilant Citizen describes that article's conclusion. Quote, nobody can stop scientists from developing this technology. To prevent misuse, it should be regulated by organizations such as the World Economic Forum. That's convenient because some companies developing this technology are part of the World Economic Forum. Very cool indeed. However, the CEO of Nokia, well, he mentioned something up on the World Economic Forum stage this year that can make this type of sound wave control irrelevant. Because why would you need to control people with sound if, within the next eight years or so, they're going to have their smartphones quite literally implanted into their bodies? Take a listen. I wanted to ask when you all think we're going to move from this form factor to something that's on your face glasses and compu when computing's all on the edge. All right. 50 seconds. Who wants to answer quickly? I think it will... Go. It, it will, first of all, it will definitely happen. I, I, I was talking about 6G earlier, which is around 20, 2030. I would say that by then, definitely the smartphone as we know it today will not anymore be, be the usual kind of the most common interface. Wow. This, this, many of these things will be built directly into our, our, our bodies. However, of course, some people might not feel comfortable having microchips implanted into their bodies. That's totally understandable, and it leads us neatly to point number eight. Sorry. What's this? Of course it's secure because we use the Secure app, which is the sponsor of today's episode, as well as an awesome email and message service provider that actually cares about your privacy. Now listen, it's no big secret that our data is being mined and remined all the time. In fact, there was a recent study that was published in the year 2020, which found that 155 million Americans, likely including you and me, have suffered some form of data breach. And frankly, that's only what's publicly known. However, all those past problems with privacy issues and data mining, well, that can be an issue of the past because moving forward, you can use the Secure app, which both your messages, your emails, and your phone calls can remain private. That's because they have their servers and their data centers located in Switzerland instead of in the US or China or Russia. And why does that matter? Because Switzerland has the strictest data privacy laws in the entire world, and they are not subject to the intrusive Cloud app. Now, what I love the most about the Secure app is that they don't collect my data, they don't mine my data, they don't mine the data and phone numbers of my friends and family. Everything is private. And best of all, at least in my opinion, this does not work with your big tech email provider just because it is not secure. And so, and so check it out. You can head on over to secure.com and if you use promo code Roman, you can get 25% off. And frankly, their rates are not even that expensive. It only starts with $5 for the messenger and $10 for the email and messenger combo. And best of all, they offer a seven day free trial. However, of course, some people might not feel that comfortable with having microchips implanted into their bodies. That's totally understandable, and it leads us neatly along to point number seven, pills that contain microchips. Because you see, back in the year 2018, the CEO of Pfizer, he dazzled the audience of that year's World Economic Forum by telling them about the possibility of ingestible computer chips that you would take in the form of tablets that would then signal to the authorities when a drug has been digested. Take a listen. Again, maybe I will use an example. I think uh, it's fascinating what's happening in this field right now. I mean, FDA approved the first uh, electronic pill, if I can call it like that. So it is a basically biological chip that it is in the tablet. And once you take the tablet and dissolves into your stomach, sends a signal that you took the tablet. So imagine the applications of that, the compliance, uh, the insurance companies to know that the medicines that patients should take, they do take them. Uh, it is uh, fascinating what happens in, in uh, this field, but of course, there will yep. be an initial cost, but someone needs to invest. Imagine the compliance indeed. And again, that clip was from the year 2018, and the CEO of Pfizer was specifically talking about schizophrenia and cancer medications. However, seen through the light of the past four years, meaning seen through the lens of COVID and all the associated mandates, well, is what he said really outside the realm of possibility. And speaking of COVID, let's move on to point number six, the World Economic Forum's praising of lockdowns. Because you see, amidst the wave of lockdowns that we saw in the year 2020 and 2021, wherein people were quite literally losing their livelihoods, losing their businesses, losing their incomes, and with the rise in drug overdoses, domestic abuse violence, mental health problems, and many, many, many other such problems, 
Well, the World Economic Forum thought that it was a great idea to put together a video showing us how lockdowns are actually improving cities around the world. Take a look. Now, that particular video garnered such an intense backlash that the World Economic Forum actually deleted it, and instead they posted this message, quote, We're deleting the suite. Lockdowns are not quietly improving cities around the world, but they are an important part of the public health response to COVID-19. So it's kind of an interesting backtrack, one in which they deleted the video, but they still made a specific point to state that they were in favor of lockdowns. And that's likely due to the fact that COVID, as well as the associated lockdowns, present an opportunity for point number five, pushing for the Great Reset. Because you see, what was once touted as the ultimate conspiracy theory, and in fact, to this very day, if you post a video on YouTube regarding the Great Reset, they'll actually add a little context box below it. Regardless though, the World Economic Forum is no longer keeping it under wraps. That's because besides publishing a book titled The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab, you can actually find that on Amazon for 20 bucks, they also published a great explanation video, video detailing what the Great Reset actually means. Take a look, and just for your reference, I sped up the video just a little bit so we can get through it faster. The pandemic has rather changed the world as we know it and the actions we take today as we work to recover will define our generation oh is the time to think what history would say about this crisis 2020 has been challenging on a lot of levels as economic environmental and societal frailties have been laid bare but it's also proved that when we need to we can act rapidly and restructure our lives the recovery from the pandemic is an opportunity we can see rays of hope in the form of a vaccine, but there is no vaccine for the planet. Nature needs a bailout. Now, just to pause here for a quick moment, as we mentioned earlier, it's relatively clear that COVID-19 is being seen by this particular group as an opportunity to implement their ideas. They are pretty open about that fact. You don't want to go back to the status quo that you had before simply because it was the status quo that got us here. With everything falling apart, we can reshape the world in ways we couldn't before ways that better address so many of the challenges we face. And that's why so many are calling for a great reset. Now, just to pause here for a quick moment, when they say so many people are calling for the great reset, it's not exactly clear who they're referring to. Because you see, that video of theirs has the comment section turned off. But there was a small window of time before it was turned off when maybe they accidentally kept it on. And during that time, people were allowed to leave comments. And the vigilant citizen, he took a screenshot of some pretty representative samples of what people's thoughts were regarding the Great Reset. Take a look. This feels like the most overt propaganda I've seen in my life. So many are calling for a Great Reset? No, the elite is calling for it. We don't want this. No one voted for this. The voting ratio on this video proves the point. Now, of course, you cannot see the voting ratio because since then, YouTube actually hit the dislike button, but you get the point. However, the video actually continues. Start of 2020, 1% of the world's population owned 44% of the wealth. And since the start of the pandemic, billionaires have increased theirs by more than 25%, whilst 150 million people fell back into extreme poverty. And with climate change set to dwarf the damage caused by the pandemic, the message from 2020 should be abundantly clear. Capitalism, as we know it, is dead. This obsession. And so I won't play the entire video for you, but you get the point. Capitalism, as we know it, is dead. The video then goes on to say that it must be replaced with a new form of capitalism that puts, and this is a quote from the video, the right people at the right place at the right time. Now, of course, the underlying presumption there appears to be that the right people should be those in line with the World Economic Forum's agenda and not necessarily with the democratic will of the people. And of course, you might then naturally say, sure, these individuals might wish to control the citizens of the world to that extent, but we have human rights. We have the basic rights of free speech, free expression, and assembly, and so on. And that is true for now. 
because point number four in our list is recalibrating freedom of speech. You see, during a panel at this year's World Economic Forum, the director of the Australian government's e-safety commission, Ms. Julia Grant, she said that it's time for us to recalibrate what we mean by things like human rights and free speech. Take a listen. We are finding ourselves in a place um, where we're, we have increasing polarization <laughs> everywhere. And everything feels binary when it doesn't need to be. So I think we're going to have to think about a recalibration of a whole range of human rights that are playing out online, you know, from freedom of speech to the freedom to, you know, to be free from on online violence or the uh, right of data protection to the right to child dignity. Oddly missing from her statement was the right to peacefully protest against your government's mandates or the right to refuse getting injected with a drug that you don't want. Which, by the way, according to another speech that was delivered by the CEO of YouTube, would likely be a viewpoint that would get you censored, at least on this platform. Take a listen. We're definitely investing a huge amount to make sure that we're fighting misinformation. And there are a number of different ways that we look at this. So the first would be, from a policy standpoint, we would look at content that we would think about in terms of being violative of our policies. So if you look at COVID, for example, we came up with 10 different policies that we said would be violative. Like an example of that would be saying that COVID came from something other than a virus. So we do remove content based on those policies. We actually publish that on, in a transparency report. Uh, the second one would be really raising up authoritative information. So if you are dealing with a sensitive subject like news, uh, health, uh, science, we are going to make sure that what we're recommending is coming from a trusted, well-known publisher that can be reliable. The third is making sure that we, if there's content that's borderline content um, that technically meets our policy but is lower quality, that's content that we basically will not recommend to our users. Our users could still access it, but they will not recommend it. Now, point number four on our list is tracking your clothing. Because you see, the World Economic Forum posted a fascinating video detailing how very soon your clothing will be tracked. Take a look. And as you can see, according to that video, with the environment as the impetus, the World Economic Forum announced the coming of clothing that have digital passports within them that can be traced at all times. These garments will apparently be hitting the market by 2025 with backing from Microsoft. And according to the video, these clothing-based trips will, be allowed, will allow fashion brands to resell their clothes, although it's not exactly clear how that would work. And then lastly, point number one is the famous quote, you'll own nothing and be happy. This was described by the vigilant citizen, and I actually agree, as potentially the most dystopian thing to have ever come out of the World Economic Forum. This took place back in the year 2016, and it was then that a member of parliament from Denmark said this, quote, welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. And the World Economic Forum thought that that quote was so good that they actually tweeted it out as a standalone post. Later, the World Economic Forum actually published an article going a bit further into what that phrase meant. And here's what that article said, quote, I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. Shopping is a distant memory in the city of 2030, whose inhabitants have cracked clean energy and borrow what they need on demand. It sounds utopian until she mentions that her every move is tracked and outside the city lives swaths of discontents, the ultimate vision of a society split in two. Very cool. Apparently in the great reset of the future, we will only have access to services that are rented and delivered to us from different corporations, which kind of makes you wonder that if we don't own anything and we're happy, well, who actually does own all the stuff? Regardless, these are the most dystopian things that have been pushed by the World Economic Forum to date. And what do you think? Did we actually miss something from this list? Is there something that you've heard of that you think belongs on this list? Well, leave your comments in the comments section below while you still can. Also, I'll throw all the links that we went through down into the description box below this video so you can go deeper down into the rabbit hole for yourself if you so choose. And all I ask in return is that if you haven't already, take a quick moment to smash, smash, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed. Most importantly, stay free.